July 5, 1943. Half past five in the morning was the scheduled time for Operation Citadel to begin. Germany would bring its latest generation Panther and Tiger tanks into play, along with the usual Panzer III and IV. In parallel, the Soviet Union would make use of the fearsome T-34. But what the Germans did not expect is that, a few hours earlier, the Soviets surprised them with artillery fire thanks to information provided by a spy that the Russians had infiltrated into the German camp. Stalin's men knew and advanced the plans of the German Supreme Command. After being defeated in the Battle of Stalingrad, the National Socialists had the overwhelming need to hold the territories gained during Operation Barbarossa, so they devised a tactic to take the Red Army by storm. The strategy was to corner the Soviets in Korsk to decimate their forces and, from there, launch an advance into their territory. But the Soviets had no intention of accepting defeat, and the Battle of Korsk became not only the largest tank clash in military history, but also the beginning of the end for Nazism in Europe. In this new episode we bring you the Battle of Korsk, a confrontation that demonstrated Russian superiority over Germany during World War II. Are you ready? Let's get started. After the military defeat in the Battle of Stalingrad, the climate was increasingly harsh for Adolf Hitler and company. The Red Army began to recover the territories that the Nazis had occupied during Operation Barbarossa in 1941. The German army had to move immediately to crush the Soviet advance and secure the eastern front of the conflict. The attack plan was designed by Erich von Manstein and consisted of cornering the Soviet forces in a 160-kilometer salient whose epicenter was in the city of Korsk, located about 640 kilometers south of Moscow. The German forces would attract a good part of the Russian army and begin to lock them up in Korsk, where they would take the opportunity to decimate the forces commanded by Stalin. It was planned that this advance would begin in May 1943, a date that would give the German armed forces time to supply themselves with more units of their latest generation tanks, the Panthers and the Ferdinands. For its part, the Soviet army was worn out after months fighting for the recovery of territories. A surprise attack on their outpost would be the communists' doom, but history decided to smile on them. Soviet intelligence received information about observed German troop concentrations in Oral and Kharkov, as well as details of a German offensive in the Kursk sector through the Lucy spy network in Switzerland. With this information, Stalin and some of those close to him were eager to attack first, but several key officials, including Deputy Supreme Commander Zhukov, recommended a strategic defensive before going on the offensive. Georgi Zhukov was a marshal of the Soviet Union considered one of the most outstanding commanders of World War II. Today, we could consider him the main person responsible for the German fall in the conflict. Due to the information collected by the Soviet spies, which allowed to know the German strategy to attack Korsk, the commander devised a perfect defense, lines of fortifications that would cover 8 kilometers of territory and that would not allow the advance of the German tanks. In addition, the Russian army buried nearly 400,000 mines throughout the siege, further complicating the advance of German armored vehicles. The fact that the Nazi advance was delayed for a few months, due to a need for reorganization, allowed the Soviets to have this defensive system well prepared. Zhukov had been one of the mines behind the Soviet triumph at the Battle of Stalingrad, so he felt confident in his strategy. Once the German advance was countered, the Red Army's main mission would be a furious counterattack, where they would have to demonstrate overwhelming numerical superiority. The Russian forces consisted of 1,300,000 men, 20,000 artillery pieces, 3,300 tanks, and 2,400 aircraft. While the Germans would march 900,000 men, 9,000 artillery pieces, 2,700 armored vehicles and 2,000 aircraft on the battlefield, the numbers were on Stalin's side, and this was noted in combat. Although on the night of July 4, 1943, Germany opened the battle with a bombardment of the enemy lines, the Russians were able to leak the information of the next German step. The time in which the Nazis would advance against their defensive belt had reached the ears of Russian officials, so an artillery and aviation bombardment was ordered 10 minutes before the Germans began their actions. This did not mean much and the Germans began their attack. On the northern front, things were going well for the Soviet Union. 
Despite their persistence, the Nazis were unable to advance more than 10 kilometers after several days of battle. The fact that Moscow was able to intercept enemy information allowed them to always be one step ahead. On the southern front, however, the Soviets were at a disadvantage. The German forces, whose main strength consisted of three Bath and SS divisions, reached the city of Prokhorovka where one of the bloodiest battles of World War II would take place. Between July 9 and 15, both sides fought in encounters where numerous tanks participated. But the German resources and capabilities were gradually depleted. Furthermore, the Allied landing in Italy led a fearful Hitler to redeploy part of the forces in Kursk to that area. Of course, the Soviets took advantage of this and, just as Zhukov planned, they made a brutal counterattack. This not only undid everything that the Nazis had achieved in recent days, but also started a Soviet advance that would not stop until the end of the war. Although Germany had suffered casualties of 100,000 men, 700 tanks, and 681 aircraft, the Soviet Union lost more resources during the battle. Stalin's forces lost 25,000 soldiers, 6,064 tanks, and 1,626 aircraft. The Battle of Kursk confrontation continues to this day. Prokhorovka has now become the central point of a confrontation between Germans and Russians after the newspaper Die Welt, one of the most traditional in Germany, published a controversial article that recounted this combat as a German victory and harshly questioning the Russian appropriation. Sven Felix Kellerhoff, story editor at the newspaper, also calls for the demolition of the memorial that was erected in the city. The journalist's justification is based on photographs that show a greater number of Russian tanks destroyed on the battlefield and a number of German casualties lower than official reports. This triggered Russian outrage. Historian Valery Zamulin explained that aerial photographs are not usually used to count destroyed tanks on the ground, as these were often recovered by their owners after battle. In fact, the historian argues, the images in question were taken after the confrontation ended. Do you consider that the claim of the Germans is well-founded? Leave your answer in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe to our channel to learn about many more military events that left their mark on history. Thank you very much for joining us until the end. And stay tuned for our next video.